Buenas and Hafa Day. Welcome to today's workshop entitled Promoting Planting Natives and Their Cultural Connection. The purpose of this event is to accentuate the importance of our native plants uh, to our cultural heritage and identity, to highlight the, in the interdependence between our society and the environment, and to promote that conservation of natural environment be synchronous to preserving our cultural heritage. It has been widely recognized that rainforests, native forests play a huge role in regulating the world's water and carbon cycles, and thus global climate. In the face of climate crisis, the international community has come to the realization of the contributions of indigenous knowledge to addressing climate change, even halting global warming. Chamorros who have developed the culture for over 3,500 years on Guam have created a natural alliance between society and the environment, which is currently practiced through traditional healers between, uh, with, native, with our native limestone forests. Thus, the preservation of forests and cultural practices are a central part of our cultural heritage, and they are also an important part of mitigating climate change. Uh, today's workshop will be conducted in two parts by um, Elsa de, de Milanari, who's the Associate Director for the Center for Island Sustainability. By training, she's an ecologist botanist, uh, but she's currently doing uh, interdisciplinary research that includes anthropology, ethnobotany, social movement, research, and policy. She hails from Belgium, but she's been living on Guam for the past 14 years, um, and I know she's uh, one of her sons is, is learning to speak Chamorro. Um, uh, she, her, her passion is to protect endemic species and to advocate to protect indigenous knowledge. So this event was made possible by the partnership with the office of Senator Bisco Lee, who's the chairperson on the Committee on Rules, Joe Kanata of the Guam Preservation Trust, Elsa, Ms. Elsa de Milanari of Yoji Center for Island Sustainability, and Joe San Augustine of the Protocol Office here at the Leg Legislature. I would like to thank all of those that have come here today, High C. Hadza Foundation, uh, UOG Department of uh, Forestry, uh, Division, um, sorry, Department of Agriculture, Division, Forestry Division, and other, the others that have, that have come here today. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to um, introduce Elsa, or invite Elsa to come up and um, share her research uh, and her, um, the, the inspiration that brought her here to, to do this work. So thank you, Elsa. Uh, thank you, Senator Perez. I want to start with uh, my presentation with an acknowledgement of place, uh, recognizing the indigenous homelands of the Chamorro people, honoring and respecting their traditional ecological knowledge and their connectedness with the land, the ocean, and its resources. Guahu is the Elsa de Mulanara. I'm the Associate Director for Natural Resources, but as Sabina was saying, I'm doing interdisciplinary research um, concerning Syrianthus and other uh, plants located at Litetsen. And I'll be going through my research with you. And um, if you have any questions, you can ask them at the end of the presentation. Um, so I'm a student with the University of Alaska Fairbanks and the University of Guam. And I have served advisors on, um, with both universities. Uh, this presentation was made possible by the Botany Societies, um, uh, American Society of uh, Taxonomy and uh, Botany uh, of America. So um, I want to go to the next slide. Oh, no, sorry, can you go first? One again. I forgot to say my title. <laughs> yeah. So the title of my research is The Role of Plant Conservation Genetics, uh, Ethnoecological and Ethnobotanical Knowledge and Activism and, um, for the Development of Local Policies to Protect Native Plants and Sacred Places such as Litetzen. Next, please. So first I want to show you this picture. This is um, um, Poly the Polynesia Micronesia Biological Hotspot. Um, and Micronesia is part of this hotspot, and it's one of 25 hotspots in the world which have high endemism rates. And an endemic plant, for instance, is a plant that occurs in a certain geographical area, but nowhere else in the world. So we have plants here in Guam that only occur here and nowhere else in the world. And when we lose that knowledge and, and, and those plants, they're extinct from the world. So this part of our cultural and natural heritage. Next slide, please. So in Micronesia only, we have 364 endemic plant species that only occur in this region and nowhere else in the world. 
And of those, uh, there is 50, about 54 endemic plant species that occur in the Mariana Islands. And I'm saying about because um, conservation genetics is, is trying to figure out if so, some of these species are truly endemics or not. Then this hotspot is also, um, has also high linguistic and cultural diversity because there's so many islands scattered over Micronesia with all different languages and all different cultures. And that kind of cult that, that connection, the plants with the language and the culture is called uh, traditional ecological knowledge. In uh, academia, they call it tech, to be fast. Um, and this is rooted, uh, place-based knowledge that is passed on from generation to generation and representing a true connection with the land and is also really interconnected with the language. Next slide. But at the same time, due to habitat loss, there is high plant extinction rates within this hotspot. There is actually 926 of the 3,034 uh, plant species that are listed currently as threatened and endangered on the endangered species list. So that's quite high, actually. And from those about 54 plant species that we have in Guam that are endemics, there's 15 on the endangered list currently. Um, so, along with that, we also face cultural and language extinction rates within these islands. And for Guam, for instance, due to all different colonization waves, first by the Spanish, the language was altered some, with some words, and then uh, at, when the U.S. came, at a certain moment, we couldn't, Chamorro people couldn't speak the language. So that has its consequences also when we look at plants, because sometimes plant names are lost because of that, and uses go along with that being lost too. And if you look two of these plants on the, the slides, um, one is um, um, Bulbophyllum guamensi and um, Phylantus sephordi. Those are Latin names and don't have any recorded um, a local name anymore. So we want to make sure that we protect these, the natural and cultural heritage of Guam by, you know, taking care of all these different aspects, not just preserving the plants in, uh, with the natural resource management managers, but also really um, have the cultural practitioners involved with protecting plant species. I think that's really very important. Next slide, please. So I quickly want to go over, I'm not going to go into detail about this, the threats on Guam. There is a lot of habitat loss um, currently with the military buildup. There are a lot of forests being cut down. Uh, there's also habitat loss out, you know, in regular development. Um, then there is ecosystem degradation, which is um, because of um, invasive plants and animals occurring in our forests and on our other habitats, such as deer and pig that can really destroy understory of the forest. We have the introduced snake that, um, that had, had disseminated a lot of the bird species, and therefore a lot of these seeds cannot disperse anymore. So there is a whole array of um, threats there. Then there is um, a lack of um, indigenous uh, educational programs at schools uh, concerning plants, and so I hope that we can work on that. And that's also due to colonization effects and. Uh, with the U.S. Uh, system here actually promoting the, that education system. Sometimes kids learn about the four different seasons where there's only two seasons and the plants here, that would be really great to bring them to the classrooms, you know, have the kids go out in the forest and learn about these plants and how they're used and that's how you remember when you hold something and you can use it. I think that would be really great for kids to learn that. Okay, next slide please. So as uh, Sabina was mentioning, these are just the overview of what I'm gonna talk about, uh, about my research. I'm not gonna go into detail about every single aspect that would take me a couple of hours, so I, I'm gonna briefly go over um, some of it, other more in detail. So the first one is the ethnoecology of Cerianthus. Then I'll be talking about, briefly touching on the phylogenetic study of Cerianthus. Then there is the ethnobotany at Litetzen. I also involved in a social movement study, which ultimately all will inform policy change needed to protect sacred places and native plants and traditional ecological knowledge. Thank you.
Next one. Okay, and I briefly want to go over my uh, research protocols because it's really important that to show that the, the question, my research really comes from within the community. Um, so Sabina actually came to my office a few years ago and asked about Sarientas because she knew I was working on Sarientas and are they different on Guam and Rhoda and you know, what can we do? do to get to know this and, and that's why it was like there's a need in the community to study these kinds of things. But how can a researcher and a scientist just look at that and not look at the whole picture? I kind of felt it was important to incorporate also um, traditional knowledge holders and um, practitioners and see what their perceptions are and people out in the social movement world too. And this is all based on uh, decolonization methodologies that were um, presented by uh, Smith and also De La Porte. Those are two um, research, researchers I'm using there, there as a resource to guide me through this. So I want to highlight for sure that this research is grounded in uh, learning from indigenous people and also try to advance, you know, um, protecting that kind of knowledge. So, and this is a passage out of Smith and she says like, ultimately research and activism should have the same goal, advancing social change of the, for the betterment of the people. So that's really important that I highlight. This is really, you know, to help um, advance this. And uh, lastly, I, for, within this methodology, I also want to highlight that um, I'm, I'm recognizing the indigenous epistemology and I work from that perspective, which is really uh, recognizing the connectness between that people and, and, and nature are connected and not separate, which is often the case in Western epistemology. So um, that it's really guided from that, um, that perspective. So I was part of the social movement uh, to protect Litez and since 2016, but in 2017, I was getting more involved with the movement and I did ask consent with um, the action group and if, if I could be part of this, uh, if I could do this as a research topic and if that would be helpful too, to make sure this is something they would really want. And I also talked with the Hedza Foundation and um, you know, if, if the healers could also be part of this, this kind of research. Um, and in the meantime, I established a good relationship with these ladies, so. Um, then uh, my research that is in the other islands, in Palau, Yap, and Rhoda, I worked with the local governments. On some uh, places I worked with forestry department, on other uh, places I worked um, with the Musea. So, and prior to going there, I made sure that I had all the permits uh, that I needed to conduct this research. And um, locally, I, I was um, guided by some local people and translators as well. So lastly, I also, um, because this, this research needs an institutional review board, I actually applied uh, for that uh, with the University of Alaska Fairbanks and the University of Guam. So both were um, approved before I started my research. And I conducted for now about 80 interviews in total, but if I forgot somebody, it's actually still ongoing until December, the interview, so if, if anybody wants to reach out and uh, be involved with this, please let me know and I would love to sit down with you and listen. Um, next slide, please. So this is a very simple um, graph showing the four levels of traditional ecological knowledge. So you have your species and your habitats thriving, and then there's people involved that use the land, you know, for traditional purposes. Um, and then you have the social institutions, and this I put there um, because social institutions could be healing, it could be um, just food production, um, and then most importantly, it's also laws and, and policy. And that's why I wanted to bring this, this kind of research out to the policymakers and show like, look, this is ultimately the last step when you want to protect, you know, um, these kinds of knowledge. It's important that policymakers are kind of involved and, and re recognize this. Okay, next slide. So I'm first gonna talk a little bit about Sarientas and Sarientas is kind of been 
became a symbol, I think, for the social movement to protect Litetzen. Um, and it's, it's a plant that's been honored in, in, in several islands. But it occurs actually in Thailand, Southeast Asia, and several Pacific islands. It's in New Caledonia, French Polynesia, Fiji. And it, it, it usually, those are usually all island endemics. So there's one species, um, like in Fiji, two species in Fiji, but there's eight endemics, so different Cerianthesis in New Caledonia. So it's an amazing uh, species distribution that this, um, this genus has. Um, so I'm doing genetic research about this tree, but I'm also looking into what the tree is used for on all these islands. So I've conducted about 15 interviews per island and, and looked for the ethnobotanical uses and also looked in how they protect the plants there to learn um, more about it. So for that, I did structured interviews, meaning that I had a questionnaire and um, I asked the, the, the traditional knowledge holders what they were using the, tr the trees for. Uh, next slide, please. So first I want to, I testified on um, the genetic research I did during uh, several hearings here, and I'm not gonna touch uh, in detail about the conservation and why I think um, Sarianta should be more protected here on, uh, at the site, at the Tailalo site, but I'll quickly, I know that some people were asking, how do you do that kind of, how do you collect a sample like this? So I made this kind of illustration. So um, this is my, this is in, in Palau. So the trees in Palau are about like 100 feet tall, so which is pretty high. And the first leaves were kind of at like 60 feet. And I needed a leaf sample for my genetic research. <laughs> so I had to hire tree climbers. But luckily, um, there's enough adventurous boys in Palau, so they, they were able to climb up trees for me and get me a branch. <laughs> and so I would make a herbarium specimen, and I actually brought some Cerianthus herbarium specimens for you to look at today. And as I will go through them, I'll pass them on. But first, I want to make sure when we hold a herbarium specimen, we always have to keep it horizontal. Like when you flip a page in a book, you do like this but where her biome specimen, you will put it there and then make a new stack. So I wanna make sure when we pass them on to just be careful because a lot of these leaflets are kind of brittle and could fall off. And a researcher like me, I, I used um, some of these old specimen to collect samples from in the herbaria. So one day maybe somebody else found a new technique and wants to try this again and needs a new sample. So. That's why I collected them, and um, it also kind of uh, says where, I've, where, I, where I collected it, who helped with collecting on the different islands. Um, yeah, that's about that. Um, where was I? Okay. So the, the herbarium specimens are pressed and dried and then brought uh, to the herbarium, but the, the leaf samples, they are put in silica gel and then um, used later for DNA extraction. And I, I'm happy to say that some high quality data came back to me uh, recently. So um, I'm, I'm eager to share it as soon as we did the genetic analysis for that. Okay, next uh, slide. This is actually a herbarium specimen that's from the 70s uh, in Leiden. So in Leiden they have uh, species from New Caledonia, from French Polynesia, so I was able to actually collect some of these small leaflets from each species, and it's the more um, species I can include in my research, the more, uh, the better results you have actually for the whole genus to, to make, um, you know, to, to have assumptions about the genetic diversity. Because what we wanna know mainly, our main question is, are the species in Guam and Rhoda conspecific, meaning are they belonging to the same species, or are they cryptic species, meaning are they looking the same, but genetically they're different. And this kind of research will be able to answer those questions. And ultimately, when it would be like um, a distinct species, meaning it's a different one, that would have consequences in how we do reintroduction, and how that reintroduction um, takes care of genetic diversity. Okay, next slide. 
Okay, so then I'm going to talk a little bit more about the ethnoecology of Syriantis. And this is the research where I'm kind of uh, furthest um, with the results. But just in general, all the what I'm presenting is preliminary. There's more results coming, and I hope to share some of these educational materials who were made by uh, John and Kyle there um, with the community, and hopefully they could be used like in educational programs or with the Zoamte um, to share some of this knowledge. So um, the main goals of the ethnoecology -eco was to explore ethnoecological -eco uses of Syriantus, meaning that I'm looking into how they are traditionally used, but also how some scientific methods were necessary because there were bugs bothering the plant and we need to find out how they were planted or how, they, how we can prevent that. So it's a combination of both. And then also looking how do these islands manage and, and uh, protect their endemic species. And I took Serianthus as an example. So I used there again semi-structured interviews because then I could do a questionnaire and um, ask really targeted questions. And then I also looked at archival records because there is a lot to find out about these plant species if you look in archives. Um, okay, next one. So this is the first species from Palau or Belu. Um, it's the, the scientific name is Serianthus canahira, variety Carahina, Carahina. And um, locally it's called the Ugal or the Kumur. And through the interviews, only one person uh, mentioned Kumur, and it, and it turns out that this is actually an old name that's currently not used anymore, but is not is still um, known by some traditional knowledge holders, which was really, uh, the museum was very happy that we kind of discovered this through asking many people about this tree. So you can see here, it's a very straight tree. There is no tree that I know that is not as straight and tall into the forest and emerges abo above the canopy. And there is also um, the flowers are pretty uh, distinct. They're um, kind of creamy color. And the pots are pretty big compared to our species here in the Marianas. So I'll be passing on the first um, herbarium specimen. So this is um, the Ugal. And if somebody wants to pass this. So, and there's also a seed pot. Look how big it is. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll go back to the presentation. Okay, uh, next slide. So I was mentioning that the tree is very straight, right? And the, because the tree is very straight, it's wanted by um, carvers that make canoes. It, because it, they can just use the whole tree trunk as a whole to make carve a canoe out. And still today, carvers really use the uh, Ugal to make canoes. I went to uh, the community college and Patrick showed me um, one of, 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 of the trees that they carved out as a canoe. And it's usually the war canoes, so the bigger canoes, because they have that, it's so big, the tree, you can use the whole tree for that. They also use it traditionally for the, the traditional houses, the bai. So different parts of the bai here, you can see on the picture, um, um, they use uh, Ugal for that. And they still do it today. It's not that it's a past use. Both are still used today. One um, use that is not any more current is the carving of the storyboards with Ugal. Before, it was used to, to carve. This is actually one that was taken out of the museum archives and showed to me. But um, now they use mahogany, which is kind of an introduced species, and it grows faster and you know, because I guess also because it became more popular, these storyboards with tourism, they're using those kinds of uh, materials. I also want to highlight that, you know, whenever a tree is cut down, so um, it, it has to be approved by the village, uh, you know, like chief. And there's a whole ritual in, involved in actually cutting the tree down. Uh, next slide. I also have a beautiful poster here about the Ugal, and there is actually Patrick holding Tele, uh, holding um, 
and adds what they used traditionally to carve the canoe. Of course, now people use power tools, you know, it's a little faster, but maybe for the details, they still use the ads. Um, then I'm gonna talk about the Guap, uh, the guap and, or Yap species, which is same species, Cerianthus canahira, but variety Yapensis, or the Gumer. And um, this tree is a small one, but it, they also get about 120 feet tall. And the trees there were amazing. They were full of life. There were like hundreds of birds in one tree. It was so loud, really very beautiful. Um, and the, the flower and the fruit look very similar as the species on Palau, but there are slight differences. That's why it's called a variety. But I'm also looking into the genetics of those two species. Next slide. So um, there are similar uses in Palau, and yet both are used to make canoes. So the Tawab is actually a canoe used to travel outside of um, the reef. And they also use it for smaller canoes, which you can see on the right side. And then they also use it for timber, but an additional use is for medicine, which is really uh, interesting to find out. So next uh, slide, please. So our species on Guaha, oh, I forgot to give the Yap one. So our species on Guahan is called uh, Serianthus nelsoni or Hudson Lagu, which could refer to the north, although, you know, it could be towards the ocean as well. Um, or it could mean foreign tree. So the, the, the name gives us a little indication of if it could be different or not, but it's not 100% sure. So the species in Guam and Rhoda both have purple flowers. Um, so, and um, the fruits are substantially smaller in Guam and Rhoda. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to collect the species uh, for the herbarium um, from this tree because there's only one left. And I don't want a tree climber in there, first of all, <laughs> because I don't want to jeopardize um, the structure of the tree. And um, also, um, yeah, it's kind of very fragile. So uh, since there is only one tree left, there is, not, there is no uses anymore. It's, on the in it's actually critically endangered, meaning it's really endangered. Um, and there's a lot of pests that attack this tree and therefore it's hard to grow and propagate them. So I forgot to mention that in Palau and Yep, they propagate very easily. There's no insect pests on them, so very easy to grow. And whenever they actually cut one down, they will replace it by new ones. So, but our Cerianthus has psyllids, millibugs, uh, katydids attacking it, um, scales. So there's a lot, it's really hard to grow them. And since we only have one mother tree left, there is only that kind, only so many seeds we can use to propagate an outland, and uh, Guam Forestry and GPEP has involved in trying to propagate more of these trees and outplant them in the wild. Um, and we planted some at Litet and too. I want to highlight, and this is also mentioned under the on the poster of uh, Guam here, that um, there is a saying from Fresine that says that. Um, Litetzen had really high timber quality trees, and they, they mentioned also the Hudson Lago. So it was a place where Hudson Lago really occurred a long time ago. So I um, was very happy to read that. So there's many trees being outplanted there, and some are, are doing okay, others had a little harder time. Um, next slide, please. Oh, yeah, no, I just one more, one more uh, mention. So yeah, it was used for timber traditionally, probably. But if somebody else knows any other uses, let me know. Okay, next uh, slide. So in Rhoda, the, the tree is, the scientific name is uh, currently the same, Serianthus nelsoni. But there the tree is called in Chamorro Tronconguafi, which means actually fire tree. And sometimes people confuse it with, you know, like the flame tree, because you could translate it the same, but this is what, all people said it was used for. Um, and they also think it might have been used for timber, but it's not 100% sure. 
The trees in Rhoda, you can see the difference between the previous slide and this slide look way healthier, but there's only 34 left there. And they're like maybe four or five years ago, there were 60 left. So Typhoon Dolphin wiped out a lot of the mother trees. Luckily in uh, Rhoda, there's a lot of, of flowers and fruits, you know, on the trees, so they still produce seed. So there is a, the Guam forestry grows a lot of these trees and, and outplants. And there's a picture on one of the posters there with James Bamba and James Magnolia, uh, who are both involved in um, outplanting these trees. And they also have problems with insect pests, but it's mainly the millibugs. So one, but it could be detrimental for the trees too. If they lose trees, it's because of that. And there's been fires recently too. So, but they are actively trying to conserve and, and do outreach about this tree uh, on Rhoda. Okay, next slide. Now I'll be, <laughs> this is actually Susan's foot. I thought it was so beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, so um, this is my introduction picture for traditional ecological knowledge at LITETS, and like I said, they often call it tech. Um, next slide. So I know I kind of touched a, bit, a little bit on that, but I want to highlight a few more things. Why, do we, why is it important to study traditional ecological knowledge? It's also to advance sustainability because there is really, when look traditionally, there was no separation between uh, nature and culture, and we really need to go back to that to, in order to preserve these, these really important plants uh, on Guam. And as I said before, they're part of the cultural identity, and I think it's really important as a child or as an adult, it doesn't matter what age you are, that you can connect with the local plants and know their local names. That's, that's something that really connects you to the land very, um, very much. Um, then they're also part of the economic identity because they're used for food. You know, we have um, an, an indigenous uh, breadfruit. We have a lot of plants that are used for healing, for carving. So this is all part of, of economic identity too. And I wanted to show this little cartoon which is saying this guy is driving by a person that maybe wants to cut down a tree for his farm. And he says, hey, stop this, because you know there's something like climate change and we really need to keep our greenhouse gases you know, down. So don't cut this tree because it's helping, but he's driving a car, you know, like probably is not engaged in, in you know, like using nature at all. So I wanted to highlight that it's important to you know, protect that kind of knowledge and it's not them being not sustainable. <laughs> okay, next slide. So why study uh, this kind of uh, traditional ecological knowledge at Le Tetzen? Um, it was very, it's very clear that uh, traditional knowledge holders and the Zoamte really uh, value Le Tetzen. It's dear to their heart. I can see when I talk to them, you know, there's tears almost appearing, you know, thinking it wouldn't be available for them anymore to go and collect Amut. So it's also a sacred place for the Chamorro people, not just for collecting medicine, but also to connect with the ancestors, to uh, have spiritual uh, guidance and, and more so. And there is the Latte villages, of course, that are still in their natural environment. There's not many places like that on the island anymore. And as a biologist, I certainly see it's very pristine. There's a lot of native species and you can really see on the beach. And that was confirmed by Mama Chai, you know, saying like, there's all these shrubs and then there's the, the, the forbs growing in their need and they wouldn't be there if you wouldn't have all the layers of, of the vegetation there. Right, so, and that really shows her deep knowledge about the forest and, and why we need to preserve it. Next slide. So that's another cartoon. I just um, think they're great to illustrate. So this is Susan, you know, collecting some of the um, nanaso, which is used for, used for high eye ailments. And they were all saying like, oh my gosh, this, these are very big ones, you know, it's, we don't see them as big elsewhere, so which is really cool. But I wanted to say, let's see a healer goes to Letetzen and there's this sign saying no access, right? That doesn't feel right. Then there is 
lands that maybe say protected, don't collect from it. You know, that's something within, you know, indigenous epistemology that, that feels wrong. So I really think it's important to protect these sacred places and protect the, the traditional knowledge systems that are in place to keep this uh, protected. Next slide, please. So um, the goal of the ethnobotanical um, research I'm doing is not necessarily, um, I want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm clear about that. I'm not trying to collect like medicinal recipes and, you know, give those out. It's more about like knowing what plants are highly valued by Zoomte or other traditional knowledge holders and kind of um, trying to gauge if there is changes through history, because some plants are used before, not anymore, but that doesn't mean you don't want them anymore as in the environment, of course. So um, this type of, of, of um, knowledge gathered will be used to really try to protect these plants uh, at Litetzen. And also some of the um, posters I made have some um, plants and how they're used, but it doesn't, it just says briefly uh, a medicinal use or, or um, used for tools or something. And I think that would be great knowledge for kids to have and to share um, in schools that they know that, you know, um, the pie pie is good for making tools, you know, because it's nice and straight. So um, another thing I'm looking at is the access restrictions currently for the refuge, because if you look at uh, the, the picture on the left, only where the red square is, this is where they can currently uh, collect medicine if they get a permit. So that's another, um, you know, like stepping stone they have to go. And then um, what will happen if the live fire training range would be uh, placed and the surface danger zone, as you can see on that, one slide is really cutting that red square even more in half. So there's hardly anything left than to collect medicine from. And, and since um, when, I, when I talked to Zuzo Amte, they really you know, value the place because it has so many different kinds of species. And it's just not that you also, the connectness with the land is there and the spirits. So I think that's really important that we can keep that in that kind of setting for traditional knowledge holders. So um, uh, next slide. So methodologies I use there. As a biologist, I like to hang out in nature and make plant lists. So <laughs> that's what I did. And I um, study in depth uh, what's occurring at Letetzen. I also looked in Mark at different archives and look how traditionally these plants were used. And then I interviewed traditional knowledge holders and also Manonko, I even talked to my neighbor who knows a lot about the forest and um, tried to gauge what the, the, the uses were and are right now. And what the need is as well, which is really important to, to, to illustrate. And the need will be kind of quantified if I can. I'm trying to, to quantify it using a relative cultural um, importance index, which I'll be able to use to say this is these certain plants or these certain habitats are really highly valued by the, the people. And of course, it will also have a qualitative data illustrating perceptions from traditional knowledge holders why this is really important to preserve that kind of resources, those resources. Next slide. So um, the plants at Letetzen, roughly you can kind of separate it into two kind of habitats. There is the beach habitat and there is the limestone area with all the sacred sites. And you can see um, cycads or the fedang is growing right next to um, the Latte uh, villages. Next slide. So for now, I record about 94 plants. And if you think about it, Guam has about 340 plant species. That's almost a third of the plants that occur right there. So as a healer, it must be great to just be able to go there and be sure you can collect everything at once. Um, and that's what I found now preliminary too, that a lot of these plants really have a medicinal use. You know, of those 94, I won't say like a, definite number yet, but there's, it's, it's a high percentage. 
The only thing where I don't find much information about is the ferns. There are some ferns used by for traditional knowledge uh, for traditional medicine, but there's a few where I can find any um, tomorrow name or any use for. So if people st still feel like you can always contribute to this kind of research, please reach out to me. At the end of the presentation, I'll um, um, can say my phone number and my uh, email address. Um, and then also, currently, trees are not, they can be used for medicine, but they cannot be cut down. So currently, of course, that's not uh, being practiced, but I still try to collect information on how trees are used to and see how we can maybe incorporate that in other areas or in this area even. Thank you. Next one. So, and I just highlight a few of the plants, and I have a poster here too, which uh, shows a, a few more. Um, one plant that is kind of really difficult to find on Guam nowadays is the Peperonia marianensis, or the pot pupot, which is really highly valued by the zoomte. It's kind of a very fleshy plant, but it's very small and likes to grow in um, dark places, on, on, on caves or in caves or on the side of caves or on limestone. And uh, is really getting rare. And this is a picture at Letetzen of this plant. And the leaves are used for uh, combination medicine. And actually today the Zoamte prepared some amuts, fresco, right, Antininu, to try. And so maybe somebody can start already or when you go out we, later, we can take some of this uh, and try it. It's, this plant is also used for headaches and fever. And the, it's a very succulent plant, so it has a lot of moisture. And hunters even use it if they kind of feel dehydrated. They'll use it to kind of um, yeah, feel a little better and freshed up. Next one. Another kind of similar plant like that is the tapun azuzu, which I have similar like used for a lot of medicine um that one is on the poster that i have here on the next but i didn't include all the plants in the presentation so uh, this plant actually <laughs> um is one of mama chai's favorite plants uh and it's really difficult to find on guam at all and even at litzen is kind of rare and i always wonder what if traditional knowledge holders can be involved in the, involved in the management and maybe help, you know, spreading this 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 kind of plants uh, at Letetz? And, and it's really interesting where this plant grows. It really needs that kind of um, over, understory of nanasso and, and other shrubs along the beach, and then grows underneath. And uh, Mama Chai knows really well where to find it, and says these shrubs and protect this kind of plant and and I've seen her collecting plants is a very sustainable way like and being able to grow further after it, very very beautiful so it's called Kamantazi or Unai both kind of names have been used uh, when I did interviews uh, the Latin name is Triumfeto Percubens and uh, these are also used for combination medicine and amotininu, and it's very good for when you have a pneumonia coming up. Okay, and I actually have also a herbarium specimen of that one. I forgot to give you the Serientas Nelsoni from, from Rhoda. So I'm gathering um, these, ethno, but these uh, herbarium specimen also from Letetzen to show later, you know, the, you know, if other people want to look at the study, they can look at the plants as well. I wasn't able to collect a flower from that one, but I'll, I'll go back and make sure I have a fruit, fruit and a flower as well. Next slide. So here is uh, Mama Chai. Um, collecting some uh, of that plant. Thank you. Next one. Then um, a plant that actually is more uh, common on uh, limestone forests is the myogene 
Cylindrocarpa, which was previously called uh, Guamia marionensis, but actually the name was changed due to um, genetic research. So um, the Chamorro name is Pai Pai, and I brought one of them from our nursery. And you can see that this, this plant is very straight, right? So same as the, the, the Cerianthus, but it won't get too tall. So, and this is actually preferred kind of material for making tools and um, a machete, dress hoe, um, and it's also a made, a used for the spear or the fisca, which um, several people mentioned. And it's also actually used for parts of the canoe. And I forgot to say that the Cerianthus here is not used for canoes, and that's because we have another species that's been used here. It's um, the Dauk, which is very strong, and that's actually why the canoes are so fast here in the Marianas, so they have another kind of wood used for that. But the Pai Pai is used for the platform where the people sit on. It's, it's, a, it's very um, um, highly valued, but many people that I interviewed said it's not as used anymore because it's hard to kind of ask somebody, can I cut these understory trees here down? So there's for sure a need to have more plants like these, which are actually common, but not common enough to say, okay, I'll cut 10 of them down for, for the platform of this canoe. So I think it would be great to, to maybe grow these. And, you know, I know that um, Joe from the Guam Forestry Department always wants to like, okay, let's grow more of these trees and use them, right? So I think that's a really good advice to, to, to kind of make sure, because, you know, for medicinal use, you, you kind of need a small part, but if you want to make a canoe, you need a big one. And oftentimes when you grow plants for um, use for canoes, you want to guide them a little bit to make sure they're the size or they're growing straight, right? So that's really important. But we grow those kinds of trees in our nursery at CIS. Uh, next slide. Uh, another plant that occurs at Latezen, but other places in Guam is the Kausali or the Bikia tetrandra. Um, and this is an example of a plant that's not used anymore. Traditionally, it was used for candles and, and torches, but we have, you know, flashlights right now, so no need for it. But still, this is one of the plants mo most people are familiar with. And I, I like to show some plants like this too always. And the flower has been used to put in behind, you know, women, you put it behind their ear and really proud of, of this, this flower. So this flower will, this plant will be planted actually at the legislature tonight at 5 p.m. We'll plant a whole row of them actually. And hopefully the senators say like, oh, when I, before a session, I'll quickly grab a flower and put that there, you know, acknowledging, you know, <laughs> or celebrating these kinds of plants. So, um, so these, these kind of typically occur on edges of cliff lines and they're present. These are pictures from Litezen. But you can see them when you look up in the, alongside the road. I always tell my kids, look outside and look how many there are. Look, there's an, there was one high on the cliff there. So they're actually more prevalent than, than one would think, you know, um, but for sure, kind of a signature plant for Guam and for Litezen, for sure. Next one. So, and then other plants cannot be used anymore, like remember that picture, endangered? Because they're endangered, and then I, I'm looking into these kinds of policies too, how we can still involve actually traditional knowledge holders in protecting these kind of plants. The Fedang, of course, has a few more, uh, has, has, um, a scale which actually prevents some the seeds from becoming mature. So, and that's what traditionally was used, the seeds of the, or the, the fruits of the, the plant, and they were grounded into flour and made, they were making titizas of it. And my neighbor, she swears that those are the most delicious titizas in the world. <laughs> Other people actually say they were not so tasty, so there's for sure like <laughs> some, some um, yeah, that like it and some that don't. But this plant was the uh, most abundant understory tree in Guam's forests. And now it's, it's really, you know, being threatened and it's, it's still abundant, but not, they're not healthy anymore. And uh, yeah, the scale prevents the seeds from maturing completely and being used for reproduction. Uh, next one. 
So this is actually my last slide. I want to quickly, uh, this, this uh, presentation was mostly about traditional knowledge, but I want to quickly highlight my social movement research um, and that will be part of my dissertation too. And if anybody wants to involve, be involved uh, with this, let me know as well. So I'm looking at the drivers for this social movement. And of course, one of the threats is land sovereignty because Litezen, you know, the, the, the original landowners didn't get their land back when it, it went over from the US military. Uh, it wasn't returned. It was um, given to the federal government and made a refuge. Uh, so that's one of the drivers. Another driver is that we that we re the the social movement really highlighted to protect the traditional ecological practice and the zoamte were really like you, you know um, used as an example for that that those practices would be damaged if it would be closed off. So access to letezen is really important for them. So then also increased. Um, threats to endangered species because Tailalo actually has a lot of endangered species where the larger firing range will come, will be uh, placed and want to highlight that a lot of endemic species actually occur there and it's a threat to an endangered species. And I also believe if we cannot do proper management or look at the species that are threatened at Letet and that will also jeopardize their existence. And then, of course, the driver is also related to the increasing military presence on the island, for sure. Then, um, with the social movement research, I'm, I've been talking to stakeholders, all kinds of stakeholders that are actually uh, involved within this political space, you know, we're of, of uh, protecting the Tedzen, and I've been interviewing these kinds of people. But is there any people that want to also be involved in this? Please let me know, and I can sk still schedule it. I would like to end those interviews by the end of December. So, <laughs> But please let me know if you want to be involved in this. And um, I'm looking especially in governance and governor link governance linkages that could be um, established to protect sacred places like Litezen or to protect endemic species and their traditional ecological knowledge at Litezen. This is kind of a case study. And the methods I'm using is participant observation. As I mentioned before, uh, I chose as a researcher to, you know, to stand be next to the activists and be part of this movement. So in participatory action research and social movement research, this is really you know, um, how, how, what the appropriate way to, to do it is and to really make the research for the people, make sure it, it, it really uh, advances for them. And then I have done a lot of in-depth interviews and I've also looked into archival records if there's any um, previous movements, which is, is the case for Letezen and how that actually changed over time. So next slide. <laughs> So I had some questions to the lawmakers, and I know not everybody could be here. It's, you know, senators have a big uh, schedule. But if I just wanted to pose three questions here, and I was hoping that maybe uh, some of the senators can reach out and like uh, think about this, because I think it's it's uh, the policymakers that really can also make a change, right? So, um, like I was showing in the the four levels of traditional ecological knowledge, the law and the lawmakers are part of this you know, issue. So how can we import, incorporate the protection of this traditional ecological knowledge into the political agenda? And this from a local perspective, right? Like not from coming from, <laughs> from the bottom up, from here in Guam. And how can we ensure the protection of these endemic plants who are really part of the cultural heritage of Guam and the natural heritage of Guam? Because 15 of the 40, 54 are already on the endangered species list. We really want to prevent the others getting on there, and we would like the ones that are on there getting delisted and, um, you know, that they're, they're thriving again. So, and then lastly, how can we ensure the protection of sacred land? Because, you know, um, it's not just only about singular individuals of endemic plants. We need to protect ecosystems that are there, that are pristine now, and that are being valued by traditional knowledge holders and are you know, have this spiritual aspect to them too, and um, how can we ensure this protection? Because there's all kinds of laws and regulations in place, but still it's not 
were not able to protect this place, which is really actually very sad. And we should tr really try our best to, to protect this and pr keep access for traditional knowledge holders. Next slide. And I, I just want to thank everybody um, that was involved in this research. And also, the posters that I made here, they were made possible because of the, um, the politic, politician commissions from um, the botany uh, societies, the American Society for Plant Taxonomy and the Botany uh, Society of America, who funded this, this kind of research. But I'm hoping uh, these, some of these posters are kind of preliminary, but I hope to share them uh, actually digitally um, so any teachers want to use them or, you know, the Hazard Foundation themselves. I hope to kind of uh, also find funding to print them large scale so we can have them available for the people to use them um, and learn more about our endemic species and how they're traditionally used. So if there's any questions, um, please. <laughs> Oh, and if you want some tea, because they prepared some tea for today, that would be great to pass that on. <laughs> so are there any questions for Elsa? Um, well, you know how to reach her, but I, I just okay. want to, I really want to thank her for uh, showing her research and um, I, it was inspired by the need in our community uh, to protect these, the sacred sites and um, our indigenous uh, places and, 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 and plants and for, flora. Um, I just want to kind of touch upon some of, uh, highlight some of the, the things she talked about. And, you know, I think it's important to know that, you know, when we talk about research, oftentimes times things are objectified. And I, I think it's really important when we're, ta we're looking at traditional uh, ecological knowledge that this relationship between uh, indigenous peoples and their environment is really what sustains our environment. Um, you know, this, this idea really resonates with me as, as, well, as, the, as, well, as well as in other indigenous cultures. Um, you know, I just came from a training back in California and the native people there, they collect the acorns in, in respect and in honor of the tree, of the, of the, the oak tree. And in, in developing that relationship, it's, it's a continual sustain, it sustains, they sustain each other. And I truly believe that, you know, in our culture that exists as well. That by, you know, collecting, um, you know, the amit, we are honoring the plants. And some, some call them our plantcestors. Um, and so that's just, you know, one thing that I feel that was very important to highlight. Um, there's another thing that I would like to highlight is this, it's, it's an indigenous African tribe, it's the Akan tribe in Ghana. And they have this, this idea called Sankofa. Sankofa means it is not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. And I think what this really is, is our Sankofa. Um, honoring our indigenous plants is our Sankofa because it's important that we recognize them and also the traditions that we've developed in, in relationship to them. And so again, I want to thank Elsa for share, sharing this. And I, I think this is just one of many uh, workshops that we can have here at the legislature. It's important that we celebrate indigenous knowledge and our connections to them. Um, so thank you very much. And I do want to invite everybody here to come and take a look at your ancestors and to uh, just commune with them. And um, they, they are living beings. Um, they have an intelligence. Um, they've, they've evolved much longer than we have as humans. You know, people say that humans are going to be a blip, right? These plants have been here for, for many, many um, centuries. And so it's, it's good that we, you know, just, you know, respect them. So it's do as Masi. And regarding the policies, yes, I think, you know, what's, that's really important, you know, being here today. Uh, it's important to look at how we can, you know, we can cultivate um, our appreciation for what we have that's so unique to us, to our island. Um, you know, I, I must say that, you know, living, growing up in this educational system, I was disconnected from 
um, what we have in our environment. And it, you know, I went through, through the Securitas route to, to, to reconnect with them, and I'm so happy that I have. And I do want to encourage uh, a change in our educational system where we can highlight and make this you know, centric to our, our knowledge. Because this is how we're going to perpetuate this very important information the world is now recognizing is, is vital. You know, we, we are the holders of vital information. And this is something that we have to reconnect with. So um, thank you very much. And I do want to invite those of you to come to our planting uh, celebration at 5 o'clock. Um, you know, and I, I, I must say that we are blessed today with the rain. So I see that as a blessing. So let's do as Masi, everybody.